The Philippine Daily Inquirer would like to thank the following sponsors for making this live stream event possible. Aboites Data Innovation, data-driven innovation for a better world. Asus Business, trust the experts. Globe. PLDT, smart. We'd also like to acknowledge the organizations that have partnered with us. Thank you to... We'd also like to thank Inquire.net, Mega Mobile, and Inquire Academy. When you're out of a job and start to lose everything for the poor and the hungry in the midst of a raging pandemic, it's difficult to find the strength to carry on. The incidence of hunger in the Philippines has been growing every year, but when COVID-19 started and joblessness worsened, the number of hungry Filipinos grew even more, reaching as high as 38 million. All over the world, Filipinos are known to be resilient. But resiliency can only take us as far as our physical and emotional strength will allow. Today, about 15 million people in the country don't know where their next meal will come from. And for these empty stomachs, the future is getting dimmer and shorter. As the Philippines' largest telco operator, Globe aims to uplift the lives of Filipinos with kindness, care, and compassion. Driven by its purpose to treat people right to create a globe of good, the company rose to the challenge of addressing a severe problem faced by many struggling families in the country. Calling on its customers, local and international partners, Globe came up with a solution that would help address the nation's critical condition, hunger. This lifeline will feed families and individuals, including many of its disadvantaged customers. Introducing the Hapag Movement, a united fight against hunger through technology. Every 50 peso donation provides one meal, delivering support to regions with the highest incidence of hunger. But Globe cannot do it alone. The help of a broader group can bring this meaningful act to scale. The goal is to feed 500,000 Filipinos together. Let us bring back the nation's physical strength, dampened by the daily battles with hunger, to ignite the Filipino stream once again and spark hope for a better tomorrow. Sama-sama, lahat tayo tulong-tulong maghain ng pagkain. Because together, we can create a globe of good. Be part of the Hapag Movement.
Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for tuning into the Inquirer Project Rebound webinar series presented by the Philippine Daily Inquirer. My name is JB Rufino. The Philippine Daily Inquirer and its sister companies introduced this campaign last year, prompted by the desire to share, inspire, and empower Filipinos. Now in its second year, we are leveling up and drilling down on the key sectors that will be crucial to the Philippines' continued recovery from the twin public health and economic crises wrought by the COVID-19 pandemic. Let's watch this. By November, most schools will return to full face-to-face -face learning. In a post-pandemic era, massive challenges such as shortage of classrooms, educational materials, and teachers are still the pressing concerns that government needs to address. For the latest webinar of Project Rebound, we have invited guests from the education sector to discuss the steps that should be taken to ensure a better, more inclusive quality education amid this health crisis. They will answer all your inquiries, so post your questions and or feedback in the comment section of this webinar live stream on the Project Rebound or Inquire.net pages. And uh, personally, having uh, you know, uh, nephews and nieces getting ready to go to school, I'm going to be looking forward to this discussion. So before we introduce our guests, we'd like to give an exclusive offer for our viewers. We would like to inform our viewers that your most trusted newspaper's digital version, Inquire Plus, has a special promo for you. Get a huge discount on any of the annual plans of Inquire Plus when you subscribe today. To avail of the promo, go to, I, go to iq.news slash rebound promo and use the code Project Rebound. Now it's time to introduce our esteemed guests for today's session. Our keynote speaker is teacher Tina Zamora. Teacher Tina is a family life and child development specialist. She is the school director of Nest School, a progressive preschool and grade school in Quezon City. She is one of the leading resource speakers in family life, progressive education, parenting, and child development. She is the co-editor of the newly published book, School is Life, Progressive Education in the Philippines by Ateneo Press. Good afternoon, Teacher Tina. Good afternoon, JV. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for spending your time with us today to tackle a crucial and important topic on learning. So, JV, can I just request my first slide to be shown. While we're waiting, I'd like to thank Inquirer, especially Project Rebound, for this opportunity. In the almost 22 years that I have been an educator, speaking about not just education, but family life and child development, one thing has not changed. That learning doesn't exist in a vacuum, and the learner does not exist outside the context of many factors in his life. If we want learning to be without limits and we want education for all, then we need to know what all means. For years, we have been advocating to see every learner in the context of what is happening in society, what is happening in their families, in their schools, in their communities, and even in their peer groups or tribes. 
most of the time when we hear phrases like no student should be left behind or quality education for all, it usually connotes the need for finances and to help the underprivileged and the poor or those who have no access to quality education. And so we only zone in to these particular factors. Next slide, please. But let me go through several other factors. Sorry, can you go back to the other slide? But let me go through these other factors. Number one, we are still in the middle of a worldwide pandemic, albeit I would like to believe that we are in its tail end. But research shows that not only has the pandemic set us back in the learner's level of development by 1.5 years, we may feel its effect on learning for several years to come. The incoming first grader has a developmental level of a child in preschool because of the pandemic. So in order to include all learners, curricula should be able to understand this setback and have a developmentally appropriate set of expectations from the learners. The good news is if a validating environment is provided for these learners, the catch-up will be fast and learners will be able to bounce back faster. Another pandemic issue is that they will be going back with masks on, inhibiting some children to communicate well or have a difficult time understanding each other and their teacher. This plus the fact that COVID is still here and may not be avoided at times, so the physical health of all stakeholders should be addressed. Number two, after the pandemic, there will definitely be inflation. You may say, how does this affect the average learner? Tuition fee may increase. Transportation and food money of an average student may hinder the learner from going to school or going to school hungry. Number three is the status of the stakeholders. But who really are these stakeholders? When the Philippines rank low in learning lists, the blame usually goes to the quality of instruction and teaching. But we have given resources, but have we given resources and teacher training because teachers are also stakeholders. When we say most Filipino children can't read, have we studied the science in teaching reading or are we still using obsolete ways in reteaching these to our students? Parents are also stakeholders and are the number one influencers of learners. So are we giving enough resources in parenting seminars which have proven that an improved family life leads to improved learning? Are we taking care of the grandparents because of OFWs who leave these learners to older caregivers who by now also cannot keep up with the new ways of discipline of teaching and mentoring, because ultimately they are supposed to just be retiring. I will tackle stakeholders in a later slide, but I hope that by giving these examples, you will understand that the stakeholders are not just the students, but also the people surrounding these students. Number four is curriculum. Some may think that the curriculum is only the content of what is taught in schools. A curriculum by definition is not just content but the environment, which is the physical, temporal, and online and interpersonal environments, and the assessment, or how to evaluate the student, the teacher, and the program. Just by understanding this, the term curriculum then is not just how to correct textbooks and modules. It is a system that involves how, where, and when this is delivered. Number five is technology. The use of advanced technology, multimedia, and other digital platforms will continue to remain a crucial delivery system in learning. Teachers may roll their eyes to TikTok or YouTube and other social media channels, but this is how students learn now. So if you want your learner to read, how will you catch their attention as fast and as creative as these channels? Teachers should understand that their teaching should be developing moving and progressing with what their students are interested in. At the same time, are we equipping students, teachers, and schools with the technology needed to keep up with the speed of development? Number six is current events. We just had a national election. Are we helping students understand that these events are directly connected to what they are learning? When there are natural disasters like storms and earthquakes, are we aware of the immediate change, not just in physical environments, 
But if the family, if but if the families were ravaged by these calamities, how will learning continue? And number seven, last but not the least, mental health. Mental health is an underrated developmental domain. It is usually disregarded or unconsidered when we plan for learning. It is an invisible force that for decades, studies say, directly affect all other domains of the learner. If there is one thing I would thank the pandemic for, it is that it has highlighted the much needed attention that mental health needs. Almost all psychologists, especially child psychologists, are booked because of the onslaught of requests for counseling. Even if we have the best curriculum, the highest funds, and the best teachers, if we do not consider the importance of mental health, we cannot connect with our learners. If we will not think about how our schedules affect the anxiety and stress of learners, how technology can be abused and therefore parents should be taught how to manage the internet usage of learners to tackle attention and depression, or if we do not see that children need to connect with their peers in order to learn successfully, then we lose more learners in the process. So you may say, Teacher Tina, it's impossible to consider all these factors. It is difficult, yes, but it is possible if we are attuned to the actual needs of a learner. Next slide, please. This is a picture that we use to explain growth mindset, credits to the owner of this image. When we educate our learners, do we value equality or the quality equality or the quality of being equal, which is the picture on the left? Or do we value equity or the quality of being fair? Most of the time, we focus on equality. Why? Because it's easy. There is no tailor fitting needed. We can produce more of the same thing for more learners. Not knowing that the same box, though given equally, may not be needed by some, and some may need more. When the pandemic hit, groups donated gadgets so the public school children can still experience online schooling, thinking that this is the need to include everyone. It was forgotten that most of the beneficiaries of these gadgets have not had a gadget before, much less have the internet connection, electricity, or even the training that will make these gadgets useful. It may be equal, but it may not be equitable. This is similar to planning a one-size-fits-all curriculum. This one box curriculum serves the average, but we do have, but do we have systems in place to assist those who are having learning difficulties? And on the other end, are we giving the advanced students the opportunity to learn more? Will the same curriculum fit those with special needs? Slide four, please. We are used to seeing tables such as this. This was taken from the Department of Education website where we can see how many students are in public schools and private schools, the decrease and increase of enrollment, etc. So in this chart, it says that in school year 2020-2021, there were 26 million plus students. But if we go to the next slide, that 26 million students actually means 90 plus million stakeholders. Why? As we learned earlier, we need to train teachers not just for, for curricular, but also for classroom management, modern technological delivery, and how to connect with families to achieve their goals. We need to consider different religions, even if we are a predominantly Catholic country, and how the curriculum will affect and accept differences in beliefs and perspectives. How about the parents who are farmers, the importance of fathers in the lives of learners, and as mentioned, grandparents. Are we assisting mothers in taking care of their children, not just in school, but how they parent at home in order for their children to be successful in learning? Then there are the differently abled and those with special needs. Are we helping out teachers and families in detecting these disabilities? But more so, are we teaching students to be more accepting in, of differences in ability? The Philippines currently has a population of 115 million. This means that most of the population are learning stakeholders, which also means that most of us here in this webinar right now are stakeholders in learning. Considering all these, considering all these facts and all the research studies that these facts are based on, 
I believe there are three major goals for the country to give education for all. One is to identify all stakeholders, all the people who are connected, whether directly or indirectly, to the learners. Also, we need to identify the needs of every learner, every teacher, and every school so that they will feel seen, understood, and heard. Second is connect. Let's connect these stakeholders to one another. Let's connect an appropriate curriculum to the students. Let's connect what is happening in society to the curriculum so the learners can see how it affects their life. Let's connect all domains of the child and not just cognitive, as we saw, that mental health is a domain that affects how a child learns. Let us also connect families together, peer teaching, group education, so that our learners know that their education is not just what is in a module, but is about relationships. Because lastly, education should inspire. I was speaking to a public school teacher based in a remote town in Zamboanga City. He said that a big number of the faculty were former students who were inspired on how their own teachers taught them, enough to dream that they can be teachers too. With these three main goals and understanding the different factors that go into learning, we create a community of learners accessible to all. And for my, and for my last slide, Thank you so much to everyone, and I pray that you are safe, that you are informed, and that you are inspired. Studies show that it only takes one person to influence and motivate a learner that will change the trajectory of his or her learning journey. I pray that you be that person to a lot of learners. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Teacher Tina, for that, uh, that uh... Great presentation. It's very interesting to note that you know that uh, learning does not exist in a vacuum. There's a lot of environmental context to it, and that there are actually a the community of learners is not just the students at school, but all the people around them, you know, who are in a that's way right, that's also, right, also also learning, right? You know, that's right. Okay. Okay. So uh, today we're going to continue discussing the challenges, continue to hound the education sector, and the things needed to address them so that no student or no uh, stakeholder will be left behind. So our first panelist is the Policy and Education Manager of Philippine Business for Education. Mr. Marco Dominic M. De Los Reyes is a Policy and Advocacy Manager of the Philippine Business for Education. Before that, he worked in various companies, among them as a research assistant at the Energy Studies Institute, NUS, consultant for World Bank International Finance Corporation, and regulatory reform consultant, British Embassy in Manila. He also worked for the Department of Social Welfare and Development as Director 3, Office of the Undersecretary for Legislative Liaison, Head Executive Assistant, Office of the Secretary, and Team Leader of the Anti-Red Tape Program Management Team of the Civil Service Commission. Mr. Dolores Reyes finished his Bachelor of Arts in Public Administration at the University of the Philippines and completed his Master's in Public Administration at the National University of Singapore. He is a member of the U.S. International Visitor Leadership Program alumni. Good afternoon, Marco. Hi, JD. Good afternoon. Yeah. So tell us more about uh, PBED and your work. All right. Thank you, JD. So JD, um, PBED, uh, Philippine Business for Education, is an advocacy group. And we have been advocating for education reforms that will support uh, and provision of basic skills to our um, basic edu education students. So that, I mean, basically, we, we meet our goals in SDG 4 by 2030. And in do doing so, we will be able to provide our workforce with the necessary basic skills that will make them productive in the area of, of uh, work. And I guess that is the crux of what we have been advocating for, that we, but that we utilize human capital development for um, as an economic strategy, mm. right? We've always been talking about um, and we've been hearing it um, lately through our economic managers, how are we going to attain uh, our goal of being a um, middle to high uh, middle income uh, country? And our proposition, our strategy is, let's look at human capital development. 
we are at the most opportune time um, of, uh, of our demographics, but it doesn't automatically follow that mm -hmm. if um, we have more um, productive youth right now than dependents, it doesn't automatically follow that the economy, the economy will grow. It doesn't happen that way. We have to provide um, and ensure basic skills, as, as spoken earlier, um, that once our population is able to grasp the, the basic skills provided by our um, by, by, by our education sector, then it becomes equitable. Practically everyone will have um, the necessary basic skills regardless of their um, uh, economic or social economic backgrounds. Thank you, Marco. Yeah. Moving on to our next panelist, Cara Wilson is co-founder and executive director of FTW Foundation, a Philippine nonprofit that upskills deserving Filipinas through training scholarships in tech. Their data science program consists of 14 weeks of intensive tech training, giving select women a head start and the confidence to compete in this industry. FTW graduates earn an average of plus 150% from before and after our short but impactful program. More than just the training, FTW also provides a support system to develop strong, resilient, and gritty women that thrive wherever they go. Kara's life experience from her childhood in the Philippines, BA from Harvard University, MBA at SDA Braconi, as well as numerous years in the advertising and media sectors in different countries around the world, enriched by her commitment as a wife and mother, has led to her conviction that FTW's mission will bring systemic change to our country. She lives by the FTW slogan, for the women, for the win, for the world. Good afternoon, Kara. Kara, I think you're muted. Hi, JV. Sorry about that. Yes. No, no problems at all. And Thank you for inviting me. I'm very honored to be amongst such uh, impressive panelists and uh, to be part of your program. Uh, as you mentioned, um, FTW for the Women Foundation is a young uh, Philippine nonprofit, but we we like to feel that in the short time we've been uh, we've been existing, we've we were able to impact already almost four hundred women. So we're very excited about that. Thank you for having me. Thank, yeah, thank you, Cara. Okay, moving on to our next panelist, Director Lorenzo Emmanuel L. Guillermo, fondly called Director Jojo, is the Executive Director of the Qualifications and Standards Office in Testa. He has always believed it is not only what he does, but also what he does not do, for which he is accountable. To give genuine service, he must add something money cannot buy or measure accountability and integrity. His career in the government started in the Department of Education as a public elementary school teacher, and he rose to the ranks until he became an assistant school division superintendent. He is a career executive service officer, a PQA assessor, a certified lead auditor, a PRC licensed teacher, a holder of TESDA NC and NTTC and Events Management Services, NC3, an expert in curriculum development, testing, measurement, and evaluation, a clinical reading specialist, and a passionate writer. Good afternoon, Director Giorgio. Yeah, good afternoon, JV. Yeah. And uh, good afternoon to the other panelists and uh, the participants. Well, uh, we are thankful for this opportunity for us uh, in TESDA to be able to put across the message uh, of hope that we bring to every Filipino, especially at this time of the, of the pandemic and even uh, beyond. Well, uh, TESDA is mandated. We all know that TESDA is mandated to regulate uh, tech work education and training in the country, as well as provide direct training to target clients. And uh, uh, as uh, we are... Uh, looking into our theme of uh, education for all and uh, living, learning without limits. Our flagship program in TESDA is the TESDA Abut Lahat. And we try to reach to all levels and all sectors in society to make skills training opportunities available to every Filipino as young as senior high school up to that of a retiree and a senior citizen providing them the skills that can help them bounce back, especially at this time of the pandemic. Now, in the course of providing them these opportunities, we have the different scholarship programs that are made available for them. We have the 
training for work scholarship program, which is uh, provided to ensure key employment generating industries to have enough skilled workers. We have also our private education student financial assistance that aims to provide financial assistance to the mar marginalized but deserving learners in private institutions. We have our special training for employment program for people who would like to have skills for a business or for self-entrepreneurship. And we have also the universal access to tertiary uh, education uh, for those who would like to proceed to uh, to pursue higher education, starting with their tech work uh, or uh, with, with the skills that they acquire through technical vocational education and training. And for those who are already who are displaced by by whatever circumstances, we have Tulung Trabajo Scholarship Program, which is uh, made possible through uh, RA 11230 and which is into innovative approaches to address unemployment and job skills uh, mismatch in the country. So practically, TESDA pervades all sectors in society and help everyone bounce back and uh, live resilient lives and be able to look into a better future, expect for a better future, for a better Filipino nation. Thank you, JB. Thank you, Director Gojo. Next up is Ilan Enverga. Ilan Enverga is a K-12 educator and SDG advocate, particularly a focal point for UNESCO's SDG4 Youth Network and the Director of Administration for the International School for Better Beginnings, or ISSB, ISBB, a private K-12 school in Lucena City. Most recently, Ilan was invited to speak at both the United Nations in New York on equipping students with skills needed for the future, as well as to speak at the Transforming Education Pre-Summit in Paris, largest ever education event at the United Nations, attended by the world's ministers for education. There, he proudly represented the Philippines and the global teaching community as he was selected as the only teacher from the world to speak on this innovative education program, which introduces action towards sustainable development into the national curriculum. Ilan's experiences with private and public education, as well as in local and international education, have given him a unique lens to redesign education to solve our biggest systemic problems. Good afternoon, Ilan. Good afternoon, Sir, v Sir JV. Can you hear me okay? Yep, hearing you fine. And look Thank you so much more. again. Yeah. Thank you, Sir JV. Um, definitely. Mm -hmm. So again, uh, my name is Ilan Enverga. Uh, and as an educator, I aspire for education in the country to break down its barriers and break down its walls uh, and really connect better with the entire community uh, so that students can actually learn to, le to live in the real world. So that together we can work in solidarity towards achieving the UN SDGs by 2030. Um, as, as Sir JV said, my work can be summarized by infusing education for sustainable development into applied values education and into the entire K-12 curriculum. Um, but lastly, I just wanted to thank all the organizers of this event. And of course, all of, uh, all of our audience, uh, our participants who are here today, uh, and just emphasize the gravity and the importance of this discussion that we're having uh, and its relation to a massive education movement that's so much larger than we may know. Because this year, for the first time ever, the United Nations it's, is making its biggest push to bring quality education to the top of all nations' priorities. And you know, just one month from today's event, all world leaders will be coming together next month in New York for the Transforming Education Summit to be attended by the world's presidents and ministers of education. And I'm sure just like everyone in this panel, the UN also understands the power education has to resolve our greatest challenges. And this Transforming Education Summit, which I'm happily working on as an SDG for Youth representative, will focus on five concrete action tracks, which actually includes action track one, uh, entitled Inclusive, Equitable, Safe, and Healthy Schools, which is perfectly in line with our webinar today with Inquirer's Project Rebound. And I really look forward to bringing our takeaways from this discussion to the summit next month, but I also encourage for all of us, wherever we work, uh, to, to apply what we're sharing today in this discussion into our own fields, into our or own organizations, because we truly need to work together to make our education systems more inclusive. Thank you, Sir JV. Thank you, Ilan. 
Next up, joining us is one of our guest speakers who will also join the final discussion later. Stephanie V. Orlina serves as the head of the stakeholder management team of corporate communications of PLDT and SMART in charge of corporate citizenship, government relations, and regional stakeholder relations. She has 22 years of experience in the field of corporate shared values, designing and implementing innovative, scalable, sustainable, and technology-enabling community-based programs in the areas of education, livelihood, and food security, disaster resilience, and digital wellness. These and other programs have been recognized, receiving 211 local citations and 55 international citations, most notable of which are Fortune Magazine's Change the World List, World Communication Awards, GSMA Global Awards, IPRA Golden World Awards, MEFIS Awards, and Cannes Lions International Festival, Festival of Creativity. Presently, she is laying the groundwork for integration of diversity and inclusion in the advocacies of PLDT it's in the advocacies that PLDT and SMART are pursuing. Good afternoon, Stephanie. Good afternoon, JV, and thank you for having me. So PLDT and SMART are technology companies where we leverage on our technology and infrastructure to enable communities, in this case, uh, learning communities, to bridge the digital divide. So education has actually been at the focus of PLDT and SMART for almost two decades now, and we've been developing technology-enabled solutions in education to provide access to quality education for basic up to tertiary education, both in the formal and non-formal um, context, so that no learner gets left behind. Thank you. You're welcome. And last but not least, joining us is one of our guest speakers who will also join the panel discussion. Miguel currently handles sustainability integration in Globe Telecom, where he leads various community development initiatives for the company around social innovation, education, mental health, and livelihood, to name a few. Outside of corporate life, Miguel, a certified life coach by the Coach Masters Academy, has been running his coaching practice for the past five years. Miguel is also the co-founder of Dream Big Filipinas, an NGO that uses sports to provide better educational opportunities to disadvantaged youths. He was a member of the Global Shapers community and was among the Philippine representatives of the World Economic Forum. He was recently made an honoree of the Gen P Leaders of Tomorrow program. Good afternoon, Miguel. Good afternoon, JV. Thanks for having us. I think we can skip the general introduction of what Globe is, but, but beyond what the public generally knows already about us, Globe has been making strides uh, to make full use of its innovations, its network, and services uh, that help bring reliable connectivity in schools and at home to families. Uh, we make it a point to go further and go beyond business, particularly uh, uh, to make sure our services are both accessible and affordable to underserved communities, most especially during trying times like this pandemic. Uh, so Globe is one of the country's leading digital solutions platforms with major interest in telecommunications. You have fintech, digital marketing solutions, venture capital funding for startups, entertainment, virtual healthcare, and, and many more which we can touch on later during the, the presentation. Very happy to be here, JV. Great. Okay. Okay. So before we begin our discussion, we'd like to know the thoughts of our panelists on what teacher Tina Zamora covered in her great presentation on the, uh, the, the basically the learning ecosystem in the country, which involves more than just students. It involves uh, teachers, parents, in fact, basically the whole Philippine population, actually. So what can you guys say about that? Uh, start off with Marco. Thank you, JD. First, I, I really agree on the enumeration of the stakeholders on education. 90 million stakeholders is practically the entire population of the Philippines. And th this is something that uh, PBED has always been saying at the start of the pandemic, that when we close our schools, practically the entire population is affected. And that's why we are grateful with the pronouncements and the preparations um, ahead of us in the, sc the school reopening. Um, and also on the discussion of equity. Precisely because when we talk about education, policies rather, um, we should look at it on a personal and in, in the individual basis, most especially right now that we need to catch up on the learning losses, right? So maybe along our discussion, we can um, tackle about the learning poverty and a key um, reform 
to address this learning poverty is to take on individualized um, learning for every student to catch up. It's a hard task, but it is doable. Great. Kara? Yes, I, I was uh, very, very uh, impressed. I thought uh, teacher Tina pointed out some uh, very uh, astute um, areas that, that have to be concentrated traded on, uh, as she was saying, 90 million stakeholders, it, it seems like a daunting task. So what we've done in For the Women is actually pick our battle. So what we decided to do is to pick a very concentrated niche and try to follow all the ideals and the um, ideal way of, of uh, reaching this stakeholder in particular, which is women. We all know that women suffered uh, a lot and some perhaps even uh, even more during the pandemic due to not just job loss, which which all all genders um, suffered from, but also from the fact that when women uh, when there are disruptions in, at work or at school or in the families, somehow women take still take the bulk of the unpaid household work, and so there's little left in the in the pockets of these women to think of how they can improve themselves, how can they can continue to educate. So. I think that I, uh, what teacher, teacher Tina said was very true. And I think what we all can do in our own ways is, is to pick which part of those stakeholders we would like to concentrate on. And I think that um, that would help a lot if everyone took a little piece. <laughs> great, great. Ilan. Like what Kara said, yes, we should all definitely um, take a piece of, of this big daunting um, economic crisis that we are definitely facing. But I absolutely agree um, with everything that teacher Tina has discussed. And really, I mean, in a short amount of time, she covered so many factors, which I am uh, very impressed by. And as much as I would love to comment on every single one of the factors that she she covered, um, I think just for the, you know, for the sake of uh, time, uh, maybe I'll, I'll just point out, you know, specifically the factor of technology, especially because we have so many um, people present on this panel, also from the private sector who focus on technology. So I think during, you know, the, during the COVID-19 pandemic, technology really proved itself to be really essential uh, for most people, uh, for most young people's lives. Um, whether it's for school, but also for socialization or entertainment, like these are all as necessary for young people and they're um, very important to our discussion today. Um, but of course, with, with equal access to technology, that is definitely something I know all of us uh, and all of our partners in education are working towards. I would also want to emphasize something that we, we tend to forget besides, you know, providing new laptops, providing new devices, um, so yes, we do need to make uh, digital uh, access uh, a lot, a lot stronger. But I do want to remind uh, and you know work with others, what work with other sectors towards also strengthening digital literacy, um, because you know, uh, and teacher Tina mentioned that current events is one of is a really big factor that education needs to really bring itself, uh, open itself to. And, you know, one of our biggest uh, issues in the Philippines is disinformation and the spread of fake news. So when we talk about digital or technological inequality or inequity, we can see in the Philippines that digital illiteracy or lack of digital literacy is unfortunately more predominant um, in among lower classes. So when we talk about more education and making education more inclusive, we need to prioritize this demographic and really strengthen their education in public schools you know, specifically updating curriculum and textbooks, training teachers, um, and of course, upskilling the students' parents, uh, as teacher Tina also pointed out, uh, because parents are able to do so much at home, they're able, uh, on the side of digital literacy, they can provide that uh, and strengthen that issue at home and that skill at home. Um, and I'll, I'll close it there. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing more from, from the whole panel today. Thank you. Great, wonderful. Uh, Stephanie? Yeah, so what teacher Tina mentioned about um, mental health actually resonated with me because that's one of the advocacies of PLDT and SMART that we're actually pushing for right now. I think with the always on, you know, or always connected environment that we now find ourselves in and uh, the burnout from online classes that the students experience and just, you know, the overall stress 
Uh, this pandemic is causing everyone, especially the youth, there's actually a need to first recognize that there is a problem that needs attention, not just sweep it under the rug. Um, second, to acknowledge their feelings and acknowledge that what the students are going through is real. And it's not just something that they made up as an excuse to get out of schoolwork. Uh, third, there's a need to create awareness on the importance of mental health care and to remove the stigma that's associated with it. And finally, to put in place mechanisms to provide support. So for us, um, we have a program that actually does that, promotes awareness and on the importance of mental health, provides an avenue of expression for mental health care, and also we help set up care communities that provide the needed support. Um, another impact of the digital environment, I think, is the increase in vulnerability of children. So since November last year, our platform has actually blocked over a billion attempts uh, to access URLs with child sexual abuse materials or CSAM. So there is much to do in this sector, and I think we all need to work together to address this. Yes, definitely. Uh, Miguel? Yeah, um, thanks, JV. I, I think teacher Tina hit it right on the nail. Uh, you need everyone who can support education uh, to the, the education community as a whole. Um, but the needed help needs to be a coordinated approach. Uh, there was already a learning gap before the pandemic. And the challenges in the past two years already just exacerbates that further. But it also highlights that the traditional and the digital learning alone is not enough. Um, we, uh, what we are learning very quickly is that learners, students, Parents, they're all at risk in various ways now from the digital divide, uh, from the risks of the digital world. Uh, mental wellness was touched on, and it's such a big issue right now, uh, and, and many others. So on, on the globe side, we try to involve ourselves in as many of these conversations with government and public and the private sector, uh, and, and really just involve ourselves in these learning sessions so that we could anchor what we do on a strategic level, on the tactical level, um, to, to make sure it complements the bigger goal of as many stakeholders uh, in the program as possible. And we're, we're happy to share more on that in, in a few minutes. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. So I'm, I'm seeing like certain themes coming up in the discussion, you know, the learning poverty, you know, addressing, focusing on niches because the problem is so vast. Know, technology, but also the dangers of uh, technology, you know, the, the rise of disinformation, um, the unpreparedness sometimes in terms of digital literacy, as Tina mentioned, you know, you just provide a gadget, but you don't provide support for it, it's going to become a brick, right? And of course, mental health, which I don't think, uh, which I don't think any of us uh, 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 cannot, cannot escape noticing, if, you know, if you just go around, you'll see everyone is talking about that for, for good reason. Okay, so Stephanie or Lina prepare some slides. Um, let's watch her presentation. Slides ready? I think we got, the, yeah, there you go. There we go. <laughs> Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to share with you today programs we have at PLDT and SMART that help the youth navigate their way through the unique challenges posed by the continuing health crisis on the education sector. To help ensure that no learner gets left behind, especially those from geographically isolated and disadvantaged areas, we continue to distribute school in a bag packages nationwide with the help of our partners and sponsors. The school in a bag is a portable digital classroom that contains a laptop and a pocket Wi-Fi for the teacher and tablets for the students. All devices are already preloaded with educational content accessible even offline. This provides underserved learning communities with access to technology, connectivity, and multimedia content. To date, we've distributed over 500 bags, reaching over 4,000 teachers and over 90,000 students nationwide. 
The package also comes with a disaster-resilient, low-cost, and proven effective strategy of teaching called the CVIF Dynamic Learning Program. Developed by Filipino theoretical physicists and Ramon Magsaysay Awardees in Education, this pedagogy trains students to become independent learners, whether they are in a face-to-face, -face, hybrid, or distance learning setup. This strategy ensures improvement in students' academic outcomes, especially in STEM, even if they don't have access to devices, connectivity, books, and even with limited teacher intervention. To date, we've trained over 14,000 teachers and over 1,000 schools nationwide have already adopted this strategy. Content produced has been endorsed by the Department of Education as supplemental learning resource and are available for download for free from DepEd Commons. To support parents and teachers in the shift to digital learning, we have been conducting a series of webinars under our InfoTeach program entitled Gearing Up for the New Normal in Teaching and Learning. In partnership with the University of the Philippines Open University, or UPOU, the program trains teachers on topics such as digital productivity tools and online collaboration tools. To date, over 30,000 have graduated from the program. To help the youth cope with the adverse effects of the pandemic on their mental health, we continue to implement our Better Today program to create awareness on supporting mental health and to provide a platform of expression for the youth for mental health care. The Better Today Conversation series provides safe spaces for the youth to share their thoughts and feelings when it comes to their mental health. Advocates and mental health professionals provide their perspectives on mental health issues, including anxiety and burnout, especially from online learning. The Better Today Time Capsule Project, in turn, provides the youth with a platform to express themselves through art and empower them to become storytellers as a form of catharsis and mental health care. Our conversation series had a social media reach of over 650,000 and over 28 million impressions on Twitter. In an always-on or always-connected environment, it is important to keep our children safe online. So, since 2020, we've ramped up our cybersecurity awareness campaign for teachers and students. With topics such as internet safety, data privacy, spotting and combating fake news, and responsible social media use. We've also partnered with Google on the Be Internet Awesome program that promotes values-based internet safety and digital citizenship among Filipino children. To protect our customers, especially the children, we've invested heavily in a child protection platform that detects, responds, and prevents end-user access to online child sexual abuse materials 24 by 7. We're also part of the Safer Kids PH Consortium that helps strengthen the Barangay Council for the Protection of Children through policy making, technology, and capacity building. Finally, through our Innovation Generation Program, we encourage the youth to develop technology-based solutions that can help their community rebuild and adapt to the next normal. We enable them to be future ready by providing them with skills and mentoring so they can innovate and pursue their passions for a purpose. These skills such as design thinking, prototyping, validation, empathy, communications, and sustainability will allow them to flourish whether they choose the path of employment or entrepreneurship. These shared value programs are our contributions to helping ensure that no learner gets left behind, that we enable the youth to become cyber smart and be internet awesome, that we create safe spaces for them so they can become better versions of themselves today, and as an innovation generation that we nurture their passions and hunger for purpose by empowering them to be part of the solution so we can all live smarter for a better world. Thank you.
And yes, and I apologize. I think uh, I may have overlooked uh, Director Chojo in my earlier in the earlier panel discussion. So, Director Chojo, please, uh, if you would like to comment on the keynote and also on uh, on what Stephanie just said, my apologies. Uh, no, no problem, uh, JV. Uh, I, in fact, I'd uh, prefer to be listening to the exchange of of thoughts and ideas as. Uh, we benefit more from being reflective. Uh, well, uh, first of all, I'd like to express my profound appreciation for uh, Teacher Tina's presentation because uh, I saw Tesla in her presentation because that is what, what we are exactly trying to cover and trying to reach for, for the factors that she mentioned in, in her presentation. Uh, pursuing education for all. Uh, the qualification and standards office where I serve as the steward being its executive director, we see these factors being addressed when we develop training regulations and competency standards. So then uh, the, the factors on curricular modality and uh, technology we have a lot of programs now that are being done, that are being implemented uh, in, in TESDA uh, with, with our flexible learning delivery modes, trying to address uh, what has been mentioned as digital divides. We are trying to, uh, what do you call this, uh, address uh, a volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous uh, in learning in environment with the training continuity plans to make sure that our the conduct of trainings and the scholarships are are completed such that uh, we are able to address uh, learning losses, especially uh, uh, with the with the disruptions that are happening. And uh, from the point of view of uh, uh, equality and equity, we have that's pr uh, basically the two thrusts that we are pursuing in TESDA the Tibet for social equity and the Tibet for global competitiveness, where we are able to address, uh, provide uh, skills, training, and opportunities for livelihood, skills that would, that would provide lead to livelihood uh, through our Tibet for social equity and uh, uh, for, for equality, we are able to provide uh, other programs that uh, we shall be able to capacitate our our workers who will be going our skilled workers who are going to the different indus industry sectors and uh, take their 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 uh, places in in the in the industries and uh, uh, promote the human resources uh, among the Filipinos. So 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 far. Uh, now, when when I saw the data presented as to the the number, the millions, then that's practically what we are trying to address with our different scholarship programs, trying to reach all sectors, all all uh, groups, all segments of society. And uh, this is, uh, uh, as I have said, uh, I saw Tesla in Teacher Tina's presentation. Thank you. That's great to know, and it's good to hear about VUCA in this. Uh... Definitely, it is a very uh, VUCA world, you know. Okay, let's now listen to uh, Miguel Bermuda Globe, who's prepared, also prepared some slides for us. Thank you, JB. We'll just wait for the slides, please. Sure. All right, thank you. Um, next slide, please. Um, so this is just to share some of the work that we're doing in the education space. Uh, firstly, at the start of the pandemic, GLOBE was one of the first uh, telcos to respond in terms of opening free learning platforms for public use. So in uh, at, a, at a time of the pandemic when a lot of us didn't really know what was going to happen, how long would this go on, and we were just all concerned how can school and learning continue. We, we made sure to work with, with both with all three, we have DepEd, CHED, and TESDA, and try to understand what exactly is the most immediate need. And what we uh, what was surfaced is there needed to be a way to create a platform uh, to make sure it's accessible uh, 
to as many Filipinos as possible. So we made sure we 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 first made sure that DepEd had their learning platform, DepEd Commons. That was zero rated by Globe. That means anyone who is using a Globe or TM SIM will be able to use this without any data charges charged to them. Uh, same goes for Phil uh, Phil Ched Connect. Uh, this is the DepEd Commons version in the tertiary level. And you also have the TESTA online program. That was something we, we were proudly able to successfully zero rate as well. So all of these were made accessible during the pandemic. And I believe uh, it's something that is still uh, of great value today, with or without the pandemic, because everyone just pretty much committed to this exodus into the digital route. No, um, So that's, that's one of the things we did. And beyond that, we also have a, a platform called the Globe uh, eLibrary. So that is a website and also an app that allows learners, you have learners, parents, and students access to free learning and reading content for early literacy, uh, literacy amongst teens and also young adults. And we made use of hundreds of, of eBooks that are mostly on public domain. That, that means uh, uh, there, there are no fees in terms of using the, these classics, these titles from the likes of Tom Dickens, you have Peter Pan, you have Tom Sawyer, and all these wonderful classics, all accessible and all for free. Um, on the other side, you have, on one hand, you have the learning platforms. On the other, it's responsible uh, digital wellness uh, respond, digital responsibility and wellness. And we're proud to have been implementing the program called the Digital Thumbprint Program. This, these are free workshops on how to be able to uh, understand the different dangers and risks of the online world. Why this is important to GLOBE and why this is important to, to all digital Filipinos is if, if GLOBE is in, the, is in the business of making sure as many Filipinos are connected, it has to be our responsibility uh, to make sure that everyone, every Filipino we connect is, is safe from the emerging risks of the online world. So all these content on how to protect yourself and also be empowered online is, is now accessible through face-to-face -face workshops. You have virtual workshops. And most especially, we have self-paced learning workshops on YouTube and also on our website. All of this is free because there's, there's a way to also access it through the e-library, which is free for all subscribers. That is also part of the partnership we had with we have with UNICEF under the Safer Kids PH campaign, um, and uh, we are also proud that Dep Dep Ed was able to integrate the digital thumbprint program into the curriculum. So from levels K to twelve, uh, um, you have Dep Ed divisions and regions all around the country, including uh, Bangsamoro. Um, all of, all of these divisions have access to the content, so do, uh, do search for that if you can. We also have, um, on mental wellness, we were able to partner with Bantay Bata, um, and we were able to make sure the, the hotline, the Bantay Bata hotline, which is free for use when you access through a landline, but through now through Globe and TM Sims, uh, this can be accessed without any data or call charges as well. Lastly, on, on, on the third pillar you see on the screen, there's, you have technical, vocational training. Uh, apart from our partnership with TESDA, we also have uh, a startup under GLOBE that we, we heavily support, which is called CodeGo. Uh, and CodeGo is, uh, CodeGo is a 12-week intensive training course on coding, you know, programming, uh, and it has a highly effective placement program for its graduates that ensures that all graduates get, uh, get a good chance of getting hired whether it's local or abroad. So you're talking about um, this program having industry-driven curriculum. You have hundreds of industry partners to help with the hiring. There's a lot of hands-on training and also remote learning that comes to this. And what's special about it is there is a pay only when hired policy where you can pay a maximum of 17% only once you have secured a job. So it, it creates a lot of flexibility for the for the Filipino who is looking for a boost in their upskilling. And I think this complements nicely in what TESDA is looking to do. And we we are having ongoing discussions with TESDA to make sure uh, that we deepen our relationships when it comes to upskilling Filipinos around the country. Uh, next slide, please. Just just to to close, we uh, we we have 
we have this program on that's called Make IT Safe or Make It Safe PH, which is an online platform that aims to keep parents, guardians, um, Filipinos in general up to date on what are the emerging threats and dangers online and how can we as a community uh, help protect ourselves, each other, and our loved ones. Uh, I, I'd like to I'd like to stop here just so that we have as much time for discussion, which is something I'm looking forward to. But I, I do want to end with a video about the campaign, an ongoing campaign that we're, we're excited to share to you today. Medyo narinig ko na siya. Iskog. Para hindi ko alam ito, Mama. Talong. Ginagawa ko yung Encerada. Send noodles and bayan. Kakain sila. Sirit na po. <laughs> Sa anak ba namin to? Oh, si Jim. STF Let's... yo. Ano yun? Parang bubugbugin? Gigi naman. Bibi, bibi mo kasi. Parang sinu-shortcut na yung mga bagay-bagay. Pauwi na ako. Okay. May talong. Tas, ano, parang may tubig-tubig. Naku, Diyos ko. Grabe. Mga bata ngayon, kakaiba. Ako ka magsalita ng ganyan. Kung sa inyo kaya sabihan ng ganyan. Na-monitor nga namin yung kanilang mga accounts. Mga ano, pero hindi naman namin naiintindihan. Ang hirap maging magkulang sa generation ngayon. Ano kayang nangyari sa kanya? Ano bang pagkukulang ko, di ba? Yep, JB. If I may add, this is a social experiment. It's this is real. Mm. The people you see on this video are real, uh, and those reactions are real. And this wow. social experiment is embedded right into the campaign. To Tina's point, to teacher Tina's point earlier, it takes just one person to influence a child's trajectory. And what we want to do is make sure we start at the closest link, which is the parents. It's hard to teach about traditional education if the, the medium of learning in the dig digital space is also giving them unintended risks and consequences. So this is the heart of, of the campaign. We want to make sure whoever we connect is responsible and empowered before they move forward. Oh, uh, yeah. Stop there, baby. yeah, thanks, Miguel, for that. That's uh, you know, great to hear that you have a partnership with TESDA and an emphasis on mental health and, uh, and uh, cyberbullying. And you know, okay. So I think we'll continue to the next part of the program after a quick break. So stay tuned. The Philippine Daily Inquirer would like to thank the following sponsors for making this live stream event possible. Aboites Data Innovation, data-driven innovation for a better world. Asus Business, trust the experts. Globe. PLDT, smart. We'd also like to acknowledge the organizations that have partnered with us. Thank you to... We'd also like to thank Inquire.net, Mega Mobile, and Inquire Academy.
And we're back. And for our next presenter, let's hear it from Jacob Vargas, Product Marketing Lead, Commercial System of ASUS and ASUS Business. Good afternoon, Jacob. Hello, good afternoon, JV. It's nice to be here in this webinar this afternoon. And a pleasant afternoon to everyone. Again, my name is Jacob Vargas from ASUS Business. And, uh, and for this afternoon, I will, I will be sharing some insights on the new methods of learning. Okay, our next slide, please. All right, so we are living in a world where technology has made it possible for individuals to learn anything they want at any time. This increase in learning accessibility has been crucial for the modern workforce to keep up with the future demands of work. Education is also more personalized in both curriculum and methodology today. This enables students to progress at the preferred pace in areas of interest and then increases their chance of academic success. Next slide, please. In this slide, you'll see that hybrid and blending learning fall in the middle of the learning spectrum between fully in-person instruction and fully online instruction. So this has been um, introduced to us since the pandemic started, and I'll be discussing more of that uh, later in uh, this afternoon. So next slide, please. Blend, blend and hybrid learning both will be very effective because of the synergy that is created be between different ways of studying. Increasingly, educators believe that it's best to use whatever form of learning suits the needs of students, whether it's blended learning, hybrid learning, or the mixture of the two. Next slide, please. Blended learning utilizes the best online tools to support a teacher-led classroom, but young learners today are also encouraged to explore and follow their own paths with computer-based modules and because a, lead, a teacher can bring those lessons to life and give them more meaning. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so these are some key takeaways when doing a blended learning approach. These include a personalized learning using materials for either online or face-to-face -face sessions. This setup can also be more engaging as well as enjoyable for students, while teachers will have a more easier assessment and monitoring with each student's progress. The importance of hybrid learning is to find the right mix for you out of all the possibilities in learning, no matter if they're online or offline, because hybrid learning in a way teaches different students via different channels or platforms, such as a classroom and online at the same time. Next slide, please. Hybrid learning focuses less on the technology side and more on the mo uh, more on the effective way to deliver a course to learners, which is different for every individual. So we must always remember the key benefits of hybrid learning. It's again, it's more engaging and uh, for students and teachers alike. No geographic constraints um, for both teachers and students as well, and more flexible learning experience. Next slide, please. So here are the key things that we should understand when comparing these two approaches. Blended offers a style that focuses on meeting the needs of students, regardless if they're on online or offline environment. Hybrid, on the other hand, allows students to choose whether they want to learn in person or in online environment. Blended learning offers a more traditional approach in terms of delivering information and materials to students, while hybrid offers a more adaptive approach to, to meet both the needs of the subject and the needs of the learners. With that said, regardless on what type of learning we approach, the need of a right tool such as a laptop or a desktop is very much crucial so we can bridge the, the gap between students learning online and, and those physically in school. That's why here in ASOS, we are very much dedicated to solving these unique challenges faced by our students and educators today. Our comprehensive student-centered product portfolio includes Windows-based laptops, Chromebooks, desktops, all-in-one PCs, enabling a progressive learning in a fast-paced world. ASUS offers a tough and durable clamshell and convertible, convertible laptops. We have the 
Asus BR1100 series with, with the style of support for intuitive input and to deliver optimum performance for students and teachers in the higher education, we also offer the more powerful and light Asus Expert Book series laptops that offers military grade durability. And at the same time, we also have the Asus Expert Center desktop PCs, which delivers the ultimate in performance and expandability. Aside from the products that Asus Education offers, we recognize the education sector as one of the main key foundations in our country. With that in mind, we are very much excited to share our ongoing project, or, which is the ASUS Education Partnership Program, which aims to assist schools in modernizing their IT facilities and to support teachers and students so they can excel more both in teaching and in learning. Here are some key highlights that our partners can enjoy under the ASUS Education School Partnership Program. One, school, schools and educational institutions programs, which aims to provide yearly development funds, computer laboratory uh, decoration, and learning seminars, to name a few. We will also incentivize excelling educators, as well as setting up um, various seminars, to update them with the latest technological trend and hardware fundamentals. And lastly, Excellence awards are also given to school valedictorians as well, offering internship opportunity for graduating students. Next slide, please. At the moment, ASUS Education has partnered with over 25 schools, and we are very much looking forward to partner with more schools in the coming months and years. So to end my presentation this afternoon, um, uh, if you have any questions or or, or any inquiries about our solutions and um, services, feel free to scan the QR code that is shown in your screen right now. Thank you, everyone, and stay safe. Yeah, thanks, Jacob, for that uh, interesting presentation. Uh, we do have some uh, questions for you, actually. Um, one question, you know, with increased digitalization, you know, are computers becoming more affordable, even to the mass market, or are people going to rely more on, you know, mobile devices, which sort of became the the de facto. Uh, thank you for that question, JV. I think mm -hmm. um, this has been talked about ever since we started doing online classes brought by the pandemic. While mobile phones are a cheap option when it comes to digital learning, the level of productivity that you are getting from a desktop or a laptop is much better as it offers a better overall experience. This includes a better multitasking experience and easier navigation with a larger screen, physical keyboard, and a mouse. Adding to that difference, there are a lot of education-based softwares that are limited only to a computer hence, making it more difficult for mobile phones or, or mobile devices users to cope up with their, uh, with their studies. And also, we need to consider the level of protection when we are using our devices. Our edu education-based laptops, the ASUS BR1100, is certified by TUV Rainland for blue em emission, which potentially helping to protect children's eyes or students' eyes from damaging. The laptop surface is also treated with our ASUS backguard um, in a way that it inhabits the growth of bacteria uh, by an excess of 99% for sanitary and virtual free from a spread of harmful bacteria. Lastly, we priced our ASUS BR1100 or, or our um, education-based laptops very competitively as we really want to push quality education to everyone and here in the country as well. Great. You know, and then, you know, for schools that will adopt hybrid or blended systems, how can we make the online sessions as engaging as uh, in-person classes, you know, especially for, you know, people have very short attention spans nowadays? Actually, sure this is a trend that our, I mean, might I say a concern that we have been seeing this past two years since we shifted to online learning. Creating an engaging online classroom session has been very challenging and difficult for both educators and students alike. But there are ways to harness technology to address this concern. We can incorporate different media types when, um, when teaching us to keep the approach, uh, to keep our approach to our students fresh and engaging. We can also do a, a gamification method adding various game mechanics or um, when teaching can further enhance the learning engagement as well as to inspire to collaborate and participate in class. Besides those that I've mentioned, um, 
there are also softwares that can also offer alternative ways of learning. A great example would be Minecraft Education Edition. Quick info on Minecraft. Originally, this is a game that focuses on world building with role playing aspects. And its parent publisher, which is Microsoft, has created a version where teachers can also use this game to their advantage for a more interactive way, engaging way in bringing lessons to a, to a new level that our new learners or young learners can actually enjoy. And of course, ASUS solutions, including our ASUS BR 1100, is the perfect solution to bridge our young learners to this upcoming hybrid system. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jason, for joining us this afternoon. Okay, so uh, let's continue our panel discussion. Um, Cara, the first question is for you, actually. Uh, what will the digital economy require from students coming into the uh, to the workforce? You know, from your from your perspective. What well, I think, um, yes, I, I think. First of all, um, I, I love the fact that we have two of of, of the most important uh, telco telcos with us because I think they're all working hard to make sure internet connectivity is. Uh, becomes better and available to all. But I think that's number one. You definitely have to have great internet at home since a lot of people are working remotely. Uh, and that's not a given by any means, even, mm. uh, at, uh, even at, at our level. I mean, there it's difficult sometimes to conduct uh, training or classes or even meetings with a uh, uh, reliable internet for all. There are always people seem to be dropping out. And so I think that that's the one thing that everyone needs, which is a practical thing. Secondly, I think it, it's um, to have an eye for upskilling. I think they have to realize that many of the ways we used to learn or the jobs we used to prepare for may not be there anymore. So I think that uh, the, the earlier we open the eyes of, of uh, young Filipinos to understand what could possible jobs in the future be uh, looking for, what are the skills that they look for, and then give them opportunities to upskill in uh, with those skills. I think um, that will prepare them better. As we all know, the, the jobs of tomorrow will benefit more the highly skilled than those that just have basic skills. It's not, it's not to say that we shouldn't be helping even those that have basic basic skills, but if we want them to enter and really embrace these the the digital community uh, and and the future, we have to make sure that we're upskilling them in a very particular way. In what FTW does is that in particular that it takes a very uh, specific niche of women that wants to do, in, for example, tech jobs and in for example, eight data science, and we tra train mm. for that, and um, that has proven to be a very effective formula because we train for skills that have a lot of uh, future resiliency. And so we have very, very high uh, placement rates. We measure and we they they have immediate jumps in their earning level. And we we're actually now working on ways to actually even measure how they feel empowered by these new skills and these new careers that, that they've built. So I think those two things, and when, when a practical thing is making sure that you have great internet access so you can avail of these. And, and the second thing is make sure that you up skills for certain uh, skills in particular, in, in our case, uh, those tech skills that uh, have data uh, portions for them, data yeah. emphasis on them. Definitely, internet is life as they like to say. Mm -hmm. you know. uh, question for uh, Marco, how enabling is the local environment for online learning? Let's first say that we've seen a leap of improvement in terms of connectivity and broadband mobile data speeds. So we have to recognize that in terms of the infrastructure. Second, we've seen a lot of synergy in between public, both national and local, the private and civil society sectors. And mm -hmm. this synergy enabled our learners to use these tools, these digital learning tools um, amidst the pandemic. But let me try to bring context to the discussion. Um, like online learning, as we've been discussing, it is beneficial to some, but definitely not for. It is highly effective, I, I would say, to adult learning and in the higher grades. But in the uh, kindergarten, in the early grades, 
physical interaction and social interaction cannot be replaced by online learning. And we've seen that through our um, projects. And if I may share two projects that we did. One is on the early grades. Second is on textbook learning. On the early grades, we have, um, the project is called Kiddie Learning Train. And we gave 1,000 learning application enabled tablets to grades one to three students. Uh, and we gave them an intervention. What mm. is that? Gamified, um, a, a, basically a gamified numeracy and literacy application that is coupled with one-on-one um, um, -on -one tutorials. Mm. And what we found out based on this intervention is that it is highly effective to complement uh, education technology with our personal tutorials. So that is the model that we see to make technology important. In terms of tech vocal learning, and then this transitions to um, lifelong learning, which we are already um, discussing, is that there are trainings, there are companies um, that we learned about in our course of implementation of our Youth Works project, that there are trainees that need hands-on instruction simply because that is what is required by um, the jobs that they are um, looking forward to. And they are, there are sectors and companies that um, really need um, physical um, instruction, say, for example, food and beverage uh, construction sector, um, such that as soon as the restrictions have eased up, they've, we've um, practically immediately transitioned to face-to-face -to -face learning. Mm. But that is to say, of course, that online learning, these digital um, uh, devices and, and tools are, are here to say, but we have to um, take on the nuances of these kinds of um, activities and policies so that we are able to provide the necessary tools and modalities to our learners specific to their age, to specific to their um, learning capacities and so on. Great, thank you. You know, and now uh, we have a uh, question for, uh, for Giorgio. Uh, how many students was TESTA able to train each year during the pandemic? Yeah, thank you, JV. Now, uh, from 2020 to 2022, uh, Tibet enrollees have reached uh, as far as 2.4 million mm. with a completion rate of 94%. Uh, to give you a picture, uh, in 2020, there were 802,218 enrollees. In 2021, it went as high as 1,240,099, but it dropped because of the pandemic to 366. Uh, thousand and thirty-six. Mm -hmm. so, so, in terms of test this is scholarships, uh, beneficiaries total to nine hundred twelve thousand from twenty twenty up to the present. And so, in order to assist our learners further during the pandemic period, we have included PPE and other allowances uh, in the scholarship. So that gives uh, us the picture of how how many. Have availed of the training, uh, the trainings that TESDA uh, provide, especially in terms of scholarships. As I have mentioned uh, earlier, uh, there were three hundred ten thousand scholars in twenty twenty. It went up to four hundred sixty one thousand uh, four hundred seventeen in twenty twenty one, but dropped again to one hundred forty thousand seven hundred thirty one, and we are in the process of bouncing back uh, and making this available to every Filipino who needs, uh, who wants to be capacitated and earn the skills that would provide them, uh, that would make them highly employable and globally competitive. Thank you, Jordan. It's great to hear that uh, you know things are bouncing back. You know, a question for Ilan: uh, What types of jobs are young people? after these days, you know, before everyone, it was like nursing and then IT, it's like, you know, so what's the latest trend now? Yeah, sure. Um, surprisingly, the question you, you asked the 
So what what types of jobs are young yeah people what looking? yeah what type of jobs are they looking for? Got it. So I mean yeah. So that question is really funny because uh, that's that's really a question that guides uh, our um, innovative academic program at our K to twelve school. Um, mm-hmm. And what I really hope more schools in the Philippines will join me in doing is um, is is intentionally teaching students uh, so that they become more skilled um, and actually motivated to take actions in their future careers to help our mm. country develop sustainably and be more empowered to fight for both people and planet. Um, and uh, again, uh, I work in a K-12 school, so I, I can share my observations of what the kids are saying uh, these days. And to be honest, surprisingly, I feel there's not much significant change in the work oh. aspirations of today's okay. kids. Mm-hmm. Um, and that can uh, be because of our natural tendency to stick to what is familiar and what is common around us, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, as well as the values from uh, shared by our parents or passed down from our parents. And as we know, it's part of our culture um, in the Philippines for parents to place a great deal of pressure on their, their children to pursue mm-hmm. certain professions. Um, and whatever jobs are valued most by the generations of today's parents, those same values significantly you know, influence today's youth. Uh, and especially when you ask the younger children, such, such as in preschool and elementary school, mm-hmm. you'll, you'll, still hear, you'll still hear the same traditional answers. So jobs like, I want to be a doctor, a nurse, um, like you mentioned, uh, JV, as well as you know, engineer, a pilot, the usual. Uh, mm-hmm. And to me as an educator, those answers give me a hint uh, or sort of show a symptom of what's potentially failing in education. Uh, it's, you know, it's wonderful that all of our sectors are supporting young people when it comes to work. Like companies in the private sector often provide opportunities to, you know, specifically college level students with similar priorities by CHED, that's than our government sector, um, especially because, you know, uh, even work immersion is a new class, entrepreneurship class mm. is a new class in senior high school. Uh, mm. never existed before mm. um, and both of these classes I teach in my school and the, mm-hmm. the point I'd like to emphasize is all sectors I believe are gravely underestimating the primary school years of, of, of kids um, and how much that impacts their future work because most people in this country even maybe all of you on the panel uh, can agree that we we sort of lock in our future jobs like what we want to do at a young age uh, and because it's when we're young that we sort of get a grasp of how the world works from what we're taught by our families and our teachers. And this means that teachers and schools really need to better recognize the influence we have on the future of our country. Um, so our teachers, our textbooks, and you know the adults, the, gar- the guardians, the parents, the families that literally shape what young people see as what's possible. We, we, we learned that at a young age. Wow. And when we recognize this fact, um, this is where, you know, I really want to seize the opportunity to encourage all of us here at the panel, all sectors, to go beyond college levels and senior high school levels and really work together to influence uh, and to begin equipping students at a young age, not just for the most common or the most popular jobs, but let's expose them to jobs that our country actually needs for the future. You know, not only for the trending digital economy, which we hear so much about, but also for jobs in the care economy and jobs in the green economy um, or or overall supporting sustainable development. Because imagine if our textbooks featured examples of Filipino engineers and skilled workers working on solar panels or renewable energy. Imagine if our private sector regularly partnered with schools to upskill youth and the foundational skills needed in those kinds of uh, sustainable future careers. And imagine if teachers were uh, able to inspire students through science, highly at DLE subjects, uh, to pursue something like agriculture as a viable career. Because as a teacher, I personally would be so proud if a student told me that they wanted, what they wanted to be when they grew up as a farmer. I'd be so proud. Um, And imagine all of of that and tell me that that is not what education is meant for. Um, so schools and teachers, I mean, let's let's not waste our years preparing young people to just become, you know, automated robots who mindlessly work. You know, let's let's actually redesign education to fulfill its potential of raising a generation of youth to actually take action for uh, a better future. So thanks, JP. Wow, great. So career placement has to begin a lot earlier. Career talks and career learning. Okay, great. So uh, 
Well, Stephanie, Miguel, you know, the, the panelists all were all mentioning all the stuff that they're mentioning. The, the network layer of all this, as Kara pointed out, is uh, connective, reliable, um, reliable connectivity. So how are the telcos meeting the increased demand for uh, connectivity in the country? Um, Stephanie? Well, then they yeah. can go. Okay. Thank you. So in the case of uh, PLDT and SMART, what we're doing is we're continually expanding the reach and capacity of uh, both our fixed and wireless networks all over the country to make quality connectivity available and accessible to all Filipinos. So bulk of our CapEx actually goes into this network expansion every year. As of uh, June this year, we have the most extensive fiber network in the country, now reaching um, over 800,000 kilometers already. 97% of the population are now covered by our 3G and 4G networks and 66% by 5G. But So while there are many, many challenges to network expansion, we, uh, we keep with the cause of uh, improving both reach and quality of experience because our mission is to enable Filipinos to be able to participate in the digital economy as part of nation rebuilding. But I just want to point out um, that, you know, what became evident actually um, at the start of the pandemic, you know, when schools shifted to distance learning is that even the most developed countries, in the most developed countries, connectivity is still not 100%. I'm sure you've heard of uh, news of schools, of uh, families lamenting that you know their children, their students are unable to do online classes for lack of connectivity. So it's the same situation with us, and uh, Kara pointed this out earlier. No? Um, since we, when we talk about distance learning, people automatically equate this with e-learning or online learning. So yeah, in terms of connectivity, that's what we're doing. Uh, we're doing our part in expanding the reach and capacity. Uh, but like what teacher Tina mentioned earlier about equity versus equality, we've also provided solutions that enable students to continue learning, whether they are online, modular, TV, or radio-based. We have learning management systems, cloud solutions, connectivity, if you want to go online delivery. And our affiliate, Signal TV, broadcasts DepEd TV to support the broadcast modality. And then for those in remote areas and are currently not reached by our network, we continue to deploy. Um, I mentioned earlier in my presentation, the school in a bag packages that provides access to technology to last mile schools. Um, and then we're also training, we've also trained and continue to train teachers on our dynamic learning program, which is a strategy of teaching or a pedagogy that improves academic outcomes of students, even without devices and connectivity. And also we've zero rated debit commons so that access to the site is free. So I think creating solutions for varying contexts of the learners is the spirit of an you know, inclusive education. It's not just a cookie cutter approach or a one size fits all. Okay. Miguel? Yeah, um, network expansion never stops. Um, however, uh, however we look at it, the, the Philippines is not 100% connected uh, and, and we, we do need to find ways to connect as many Filipinos. But more than connecting, I think the deeper conversation is what are we going to do with the with the connection, right? we, we, we've already seen during the pandemic that even the majority of people and Filipinos, learners, teachers, parents who, who are already connected choose not to go online for remote learning. Why is that? Right? It's, it's, not just, it's not just the internet that will, is a solve all. And, and we've, we've heard that uh, multiple times today. Internet is life, maybe, but not for everyone. What happens to the farmer? What happens to the e-sector? What happens if you give internet to the e-sector or, or a free mobile phone? Is that the key? It's more than just the technology. Just technology is neither good nor bad. It doesn't necessarily mean it's the most helpful tool. But how, how do all these convergence points and partners work together to make sure the internet as a tool is, is the most powerful tool you could use by that stakeholder? And if it isn't, let's not force it also. Um, so what, what we did find out is, for example, you have, you have um, public, school, public schools around the country. A lot of them just wanted to make sure there is a, there, there is a minimal repository uh, for learning just to make the digital learning uh, reasonable for those who are not mm -hmm. tech savvy. Yet. Mm -hmm. So that is very crucial to, to get everyone 
to try to be involved and to immerse themselves organically. Because if you force internet upon, upon someone, if you force using a laptop for someone who's never used a laptop, uh, the success rate is low. Uh, I, I've yet to see, uh, I, I've yet to see uh, a case study where you, you, you jump on communities and introduce new technology without proper long-term guidance on how to maximize it and say that it's successful. So I guess to, to, uh, just to answer the question more directly, uh, when we talk about internet, you can count on, on the telcos. Uh, this, is, this is nation building. So when, when it's nation building, it goes beyond competition. This, mm. this is always tied to the conversations we have with government, um, nonprofit organizations to move the needle when it comes to the digital divide. That said, uh, there, I, I always want to stress the bigger issue of even those who are connected, are we helping them enough? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's something we always ask ourselves in Globe. What else can we do? Um, even beyond education, you, you, can't, you can't prioritize education in a community that is reeling from hunger, from health. Mm -hmm. Maybe that should come first before a laptop. So if, if we're talking about um, off-grid areas, uh, it, it took a lot of conversations and, str and strat to come up with Consulta MD, for example. Consulta MD is, a, is one of the fastest growing startups inside Globe that allows communities away from hospitals to get access to a doctor via not just teleconsult, but via voice. If you have 2G, you're good. Uh, and sometimes that moves the needle in terms of education because on a parents and the parents' mind, the fam in the minds of the families with health issues, I no longer have to deal with this because this is handled. So you look at the Maslow hierarchy of need, and there's there's a lot of value in taking a look at it before going straight to the top to say internet is life. But you can count on us to be there right at the bottom to build upwards. I hope Wonderful. that answers. Yeah, it does. You know, and it's good that you know you pointed out that. Uh... You know, connectivity isn't like the only, uh, you know, sort of like the only factor required. And that's actually like the next question for all you guys, you know, you know connectivity is a part of it. But what other measures are be taken by both government and private sector to reach students in remote parts of the country? I mean, you know, it doesn't remain in presto, you have uh, an internet cable landing and you have internet there. Does that mean, you know, you've done, you, you've done it right? Yeah. Um, sorry, was that a did you want me yeah, to that's quite, it's a question for all the yeah. panelists who have, whoever wants to uh, start off, you know. Yeah, um, internet uh, as a tool, we want to make sure that first and foremost, that the risk and the dangers, all these unintended consequences of being online is first addressed before we can use it in an empowered way. But hindi so masabay yung mga risks sa mga uh, things we're actually there to use it for. Otherwise, um you know, uh, you'll end up with Filipinos who are who might be misguided in the ways that they use the internet and are susceptible to the risk and dangers online. Um, online sexual exploitation of children is on the rise, especially during the pandemic. And I can say so much more about it, but the point is to to first make sure we protect the Filipino people first. Okay, so um, well, just got word that we're sort of running a bit of um, running a bit short on time, but so we'll go to this second question. Uh, you know, there have been several cases of older adults uh, returning to school to complete, you know, degrees or secondary studies. And how do we create an enabling environment for these older students? How do we encourage them to convince them that, you know, there's, well, there's no shame in going back to, uh, to, uh, to going back to class, basically? Maybe we'll start with uh, Kara. Yeah, I was hoping you saw my raised hand there, JV. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, I think the, our experience with FTW is that every cohort that we have that's applying for, for our data science scholarship program, there's always two or three that are what you call maybe returning to the workforce after mm -hmm. uh, having been maybe stay-at-home moms or spending most of the... And, you know, they are some of the most successful. And I think it's also because... Um, they're more mature, they know exactly what they want. And so they they go for it in a way that we encourage very much. Uh, we look for these gritty driven career switchers um, at FTW, but uh, also because um, 
they say that traditional hiring practices in corporate don't consider them. Mm. So there's there's a need for some corporate to sort of um, innovate a little bit in how they look for talent and consider those non-traditional sources of talent, especially in the tech fields, mm. because basically you don't need even sometimes any kind of degree to learn some of these skills. So I think that maybe innovating hiring practices a little bit more because in our experience, when you do give, in our case, women, and you give these women the chance, they really do excellently and very well. So, and the more of them that that can speak about this, you know, representation matters. You know, the more that more of them that can speak about it, the more others will be encouraged to do the same and not feel like, oh, I'm too old to learn something new, you know. Uh, uh, Giorgio, I understand, you know, I think you mentioned that Tessa has some programs for uh, for older workers. Yeah, so. Thanks, thanks, David. Now, in, in Tesla, we take pride that Tibet can serve all ages from the senior high school students, the out-of-school youth who cannot uh, continue education and needs to work, or even to the retirees who may need entrepreneurial skills to get to set up a business during the retirement and anyone can take advantage of these skills however the importance of tibet uh, became even more apparent during the pandemic period even uh, with professionals uh, establishing their own businesses and OFWs uh, who were left without jobs and they were forced to find alternative ways to get employed in 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 Tibet, we don't see the stigma of a young and an old learner going back to school, because anyone who goes into Tibet has that intrinsic motivation to acquire something that can make him a better person. So, so regardless of age, uh, this it will work. And in fact, we have always pushed uh, for lifelong learning in Tibet, and we firmly believe that lifelong learning uh, is Tibet. Uh, and that is why this year and the following years, as we formulate the next cycle of the National Technical Education and Skills Development Plan, we shall be focusing more on upskilling and reskilling of workers, including mm -hmm. the employed, the underemployed, and the unemployed. In fact, our Tulung Trabajo Scholarship uh, Program targets employed workers who want to expand their current skills and workers for emerging sectors. With the help of industry boards, uh, we are now working on higher impact Tibet. And mm. we shall ensure that workers will have better access to scholarships and other services. And we shall also expand and strengthen our test the online program to allow workers and stay-at-home moms or dads who cannot yet find the time to study in institutions may enroll for free uh, in the test the online program flat platform, and uh, it has been pointed out a while ago uh, by by uh, Jacob uh, and and Globe, uh, yeah, by 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 Miguel, and uh, uh, we we shall uh, ensure that they will have the best opportunities uh, to to pursue better opportunities. And then another aspect that we are looking into that address uh, the seamless move mobility. Of, of education and uh, and uh, skills acquisition is operationalizing the Philippines qualification framework, uh, which will allow workers to continue their studies through pathways, uh, credit transfer, and equivalencies. We shall be introducing the Philippine credit transfer system that would operate in conjunction with the Philippine uh, qualifications framework and the Ladder Education Act. Uh, uh, and that the PCTS will give a steady ladder or a ramp to the learner's journey in the education system in the Philippines and eventually attain the highest level in the education path of the Philippine qualification framework seamlessly. One consolation that we have, and in fact fulfillment that we have in TESDA, is that those who, are, those who enroll in TESDA would like really to acquire something that they can use to improve their lives. And mm. so uh, we continue, we, we are working now on offering micro-credential courses or the nano programs or the short bite-sized bite courses that can be credited uh, 
in his portfolio to empower to empower workers uh, for continuous learning and as she builds up her skills throughout their lives. So workers can have their skills recognized through national competency assessment and certification and through the, through the concept of recognition of prior learning. So in TESDA, we operate uh, across sectors in the society. Thank you, Jamie. Oh, that's, that's great to hear. You know, uh, Marco? Yes, JD, and I'd just like to dovetail on the points raised by uh, our director from TESDA. And we have a project, Youth Works, apart, we partner with TESDA on, on this project. And the model works because there is private sector participation mm. um, in terms of the end goal, employment. So we um, have these um, individuals who are not, who doesn't have access to um, skills training, but has shows potential in terms of their employability. We provide them, we, we undergo them into our intervention, which are basically um, life skills learning and work-based learning. And then at the end of it, they we partner with um, companies so that they will be able to provide um, these trainees with um, with positions and slots in, the, in their companies. So what is the learning here? We are able to um, have these adult learners undergo with reskilling and upskilling through informational means by telling them that at the end of this training, because it is a battle of their attention of opportunity cost, instead, would I go to training? Would I go to, um, or go just pursue um, low-skilled, low-paying jobs, but because I need the job to, to, to pay for my daily needs. So it's a battle for, for um, priorities. But once we provide them with the information that the returns of these trainings can actually be seen because at the end of it, you have your companies um, practically waiting for, um, for you to finish this training, then it is much easier to, to, to get them incentivized into training and upskilling. Second is that there has to be a, a resource um, incentive that is, say, for example, on the policy level, there could be um, similar uh, policies that can be adopted, like skills vouchers, like um, what is being done with um, in, in Singapore. So mm. these projects, like what we do in, in youth works, we provide this um, convergence of the private sector with the public sector providing the training. And at the end of it, the benefits are, uh, are felt by our um, beneficiaries who given the right opportunity to be able to train, they will excel. Great, you know. Um, Ilan, Adult learning, is it part of the sustainable, SD, sustainable development goals? Absolutely. <laughs> um, and it's definitely a priority in the upcoming Transforming Education Summit. Um, and uh, just, I guess, um, one specific example we can, uh, I can share from my personal work is that one aspect or one place that it's very doable and practical to promote lifelong learning for people who are older is through schools because um, a lot of adults have children uh, and schools are a perfect sort of venue and space to you know break down that shame um, mm. or or that type of you know mindset that it's it's you know you shouldn't be going to school at an older age because parents are always motivated to do what they can to to make sure that their kids have the best chance that they they have in life and again we keep stressing and we've we talked about it during today's session that um, parents and families play an integral role in the development of a, of a child. So that I think is a wonderful opportunity that I hope um, more of us can, can capitalize on. Great, great to hear. Stephanie? Yeah, um, so for in terms of lifelong learning, no? so we at TLDT and SMART were, were firm believers in continuing learning. So in the company, we actually have both synchronous and asynchronous learning sessions that are both for your professional growth and your personal growth. And I think the shift to online or distance learning has actually made it easier and uh, more attractive to either finish your studies or pursue secondary studies and with the opening up of the information gateway, it's which is enabled by technology, there's now a, a wider range of content that can be pursued um, aligned with your varying interests. So I think making, uh, making, uh, making access to these studies easier, such as putting it online, 
allowing for more flexible hours or asynchronous learning and making it financially viable, especially now, no, we have, it's the age of YouTube univer university where we mm -hmm. can actually practically learn any skill you want you want to learn for free and with, a, with just a click of a button. So I think that will go a long way to encouraging lifelong learning. Great. Miguel? Yeah, um, nothing much to add other than, you know, the, the, the digital platform is the way to go as far as putting content. You have the long format, you have the short format, and even the short format is segmented into multiple sessions to create a whole long format. So kanya mm kanyang -hmm. but it's it is really the time to uh to populate content online. Uh that that helps onboard as many Filipinos ac across segments. Yeah, definitely agree with you, agree with that. Yeah. You know. And uh now to close out today's session, we invited Mr. E. C. Feingold, UNICEF Chief of Education to share his take on learning without limits, making education more inclusive. E.C. Feingold is a Chief of Education at UNICEF Philippines, Master of Public Affairs from Princeton University with more than 15 years of experience in the public sector and international organizations to the design, implementation, and evaluation of education and social programs. E.C. is the former National Director of Secondary Education at the Ministry of Education in Peru and General Director of Social Policy at the Ministry of Social Development and Inclusion in Peru. He also worked in the World Bank education team in Washington, D.C., and before UNICEF as Global Director of Policy at Teach for All in London. Good afternoon, Isi. Good afternoon, and thank you for, for this kind introduction and invitation to, to present today. I have prepared a few slides with uh, some recommendations for learning recovery in the, in the Philippines. Um, but before I jump to the, to the, uh, the specific recommendations, um, I'd like to share just uh, briefly some key uh, uh, useful information about the context. Although, I mean, uh, I know that um, in the previous um, presentations and interventions from the panel members, most of these topics have already been covered. But um, we know that the COVID-19 pandemic, um, and specifically the school closure policy, um, are having strong negative effects um in in terms of learning poverty and learning inequality and together with uh, recent natural disasters the situation for some children in, in especially in some areas of the philippines are um at great risk in terms of their their learning levels um but even before the pandemic the the philippines was already in the middle of a learning crisis these are uh, results from a unicef uh, international learning assessment that we call CPLM or Southeast Asia Primary Learning Metrics. So it's a, an international assessment for grade five students. And we found in this study that only 10% of the students in the, in the Philippines were reaching the minimum expected the standards in reading and only 17% uh, of the students in the Philippines were reaching this um, a minimum expected standards. And this is consistent with results from PISA that uh, we all have uh, read in the news um, and other international assessments and national assessments. So the in all of them, less than 20% of, of the students in primary and secondary level are, are reaching the, the expected level for, for their age. So this is a, a critical situation that has of course aggravated with uh, one of the longest uh, school closures in the world. Now, this is a graph from, from a research from UNICEF, UNESCO, and the World Bank. And there is a correlation you know, between the, um, the learning poverty and the, um, the duration of school closures in different, different countries of, of the world. So this... Uh, means that the, those countries that have uh, um, stated the, the longest school closure are, are those who had, at the same time, the lower proportion of, of children um, in learning poverty. And, but these are, I mean, mostly on cognitive skills, but I also want to relate uh, these to non-cognitive non skills or 21st century skills that are also um, 
found in a in the PISA in the PISA study that the Philippines participated uh, for the first time in 2018. So uh, there is this graph that correlates the performance in in PISA in terms of learning with um, a variable that was um, created for, for this PISA test that is called growth mindset. So basically uh, PISA defines growth mindset as the, um, the, um, uh, the belief that a, a student has regarding their, their intelligence. If they think that their intelligence can grow or if they think that their intelligence is fixed. So, um, so the higher the proportion of students that think that their intelligence can grow and is flexible are the ones with more um, growth mindset or with a growth mindset. Um, the lower the proportion of students who think that their intelligence uh, can grow or um, it's uh, countries with low growth mindset. And when we compare those countries uh, that participated in PISA, there is a strong correlation. So the higher the proportion of the students in, in, the, in, uh, in, in, in the country, in each country that uh, think that their intelligence can grow, the, the better results these countries and these students um, achieve in, in the PISA test. So a, there is a, a strong correlation. Um, and we we know that the Philippines had low results in in PISA, uh, but all, at the same time, um, what we found and we saw in this study is that the Philippines is also one of the countries with uh, uh, lower students with growth mindset. So uh, almost two thirds almost two thirds of the students in the Philippines think that their intelligence is fixed, no? which was a belief in the past. No? We know uh, after many years of research that uh, there are, first, there are different types of intelligence, and second, that the, the, the level of intelligence are, are not fixed, that they can, can improve. So, but there is a still this, this belief. No? And this is, of course, related to self-confidence and the capacity to um, uh, um, believe in, in yourself and, and and dedicate more, 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 more time and more effort in, in your studies. Um, but I wanted to share just this um, um, information, this uh, specific um, uh, evidence from the Philippines. But also, we know that with COVID nineteen, so there is more inequality in the education system. There are more dropouts, especially among the most disadvantaged. And there is, as, as we have here today, an even access to internet at, and gadgets for learning. Also, uh, the learning loss um, that has been measured in other countries after the school closure is, is very big. Um, in, in, some, in some countries, it's even like 70% of, of, of learning loss. Um, and the, in, in the best cases, it's around 30%. No? So 30% of what a student should have learned um is not happening in the best in the best cases and and of course this is also related to the future earnings of the students now there is a, there are also some estimates on the loss of our average annual earning for for these students for for the future um this is only on on the effects related to education and the economy but also there are many other effects of uh, the school closure uh, in terms of um, increasing child labor, increasing um, um, uh, violence, um, and also increasing teen pregnancy, and, and so on. So there are many other negative effects of, of this point. So what are the recommendations? Um, so these are part of... Uh, what the United Nations agencies, the Philippines are, are proposing to the, to the Department of Education and to the government of the Philippines um, as part of the preparation for the Transforming Education Summit. As, as you might have heard, um, the main topic for the meetings of the heads of states of the UN General Assembly in September in New York is on education. It has been prioritized by the UN 
Secretary General and all heads of states will be participating in this Transforming Education Summit. So some of the recommendations for the Philippines are first to reopen all preschools, schools and learning centers as, as soon as possible. We know that the Department of Education has recently released the, the DEPET Order 34. So this is going in, in that direction, but it's important that preschools uh, and, um, and other learning centers beyond basic education can also provide face-to-face uh, -face classes because um, the distance learning modalities are not a replacement no, for that. So our second, second best options, and there is learning loss even with uh, online, um, this, I mean, online learning. Um, and this should be, of course, a company with the other services that are provided at schools, including vaccination, uh, school feeding, uh, and, and in general, health and health and protection in, in schools and ensuring safety uh, and uh, ensuring a safety and healthy opening of schools. The second is on the need to conduct nationwide rapid literacy and numeracy assessments and implement remedial programs. So after two years of school closure, of course, there is uh, some level of learning loss. The students are uh, a different level of learning. So it's important to measure that and to have targeted um, catch-up programs to minimize, to reduce the learning loss. We know some experiences already successful in, in different regions in the Philippines for this, but it's important to extend this nationwide. The third one is on elevating the value of the teaching profession. So the quality of uh, every education system depends on the quality of, of, the, of the teaching in each country. That's uh, something that has been proven uh, along the years. So teachers need to be uh, um, motivated, incentivized, uh, trained, and of course, uh, uh, supported to, to, to make the most of the learning time for their students. And one concrete uh, recommendation here includes reducing the, the non-teaching activities for teacher by hiring uh, uh, support for the schools that would help te teachers to focus on, on the learning process. The fourth one is on launching a national digital learning program, including uh, internet connectivity to, to all schools by 2030, and also the provision of devices with learning content for rural and last mile schools in the in the short and very short uh, run. And finally, all of these and and more and more uh, recommendations because this is just uh, a few of them uh, would require more investments and more budget allocation in the education system. So the UN is recommending that the budget for education is. Uh, at least 6% 6, 6 of GDP by the year 2030. At this point is uh, below 4%. And also um, the education budget should be at least 20% of the national budget. Now at this point is around 15%. We are also recommending to uh, dedicate 10% of the education budget to early childhood, specifically to preschools, and child development centers and kindergarten, which are, as we know, and there is vast evidence, a key stage uh, for the learning process. We have seen in numerous studies that those children that have access to preschool have better results later in primary, secondary uh, education uh, than those students that were not able to, to attend preschool. And finally, Another specific recommendation is to double the special education um, uh, funds um, from 1% to 2% at the LGU level. So this, this uh, uh, SEF, the special education fund, comes from the real property tax that is collected at the local level. And at the moment, the, the policy is that 1% of, of these taxes that are collected uh, go to education. So the proposal is to increase this to 2%, not to continue increasing not only the resources, but also the engagement and the commitment from the local government units to, to the education process. Uh, I know the time is limited, so I, I, I had to, to choose some of these recommendations that I think are, are critical in, in the process. But of course, uh, this list um, 
is more extensive. I'm, I'm happy to answer questions or to uh, respond to, to comment. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you so much again, Easy, for joining us this afternoon and enlightening us with your presentation. Um, you know, there's still so many things that we ought to discuss. In fact, we're, we're talking about it in the chat, but that's all the time we have for this Inquire Project Rebound webinar. Uh, before the end of the program, let's hear a final message from our guests. Uh, let's start off with Kara. Um, thank you very much for having me. It was it was a really good learning session for me as well, and and I'm inspired by by what Teacher Tina said that each individual can make a difference, and um, I think that the only way to start helping is to start. And I think that everyone in this panel has that mindset. And I hope that the listeners will have that as well. Great. Thank you, Carol. Direct Jojo? Yeah. Uh, in uh, in TESDA, we shall uh, continue our programs, services, and initiatives uh, to ensure quality, inclusive Tibet where the learner shall be the is the primary focus of all our programs and policies of course with the help of uh, the industry our partners uh, in government and academe the lgus and international development partners and uh, we aim to provide quality lifelong learning opportunities through techvoc education and training thank you thank you Giorgio. stephanie do share your message for our viewers today yeah, so for us in PLDT and SMART, we'll continue to develop technology-enabled solutions that are aligned with the varying context of our learning communities to help a nation rebuilding and to ensure that no learner gets left behind. And I'm looking forward to working with partners, those who are here and who are listening, um, also from the government, a civil service society, and also the private sector to push this forward. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Miguel, your message for our viewers today. Yeah, I was just messaging the chat there. I was I, I, yeah, I heard it. I saw it. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. I enjoyed the, the learnings there on, on growth mindset. It it speaks to the importance of uh, the need to look at the mental wellness of not just kids and learners, but all Filipinos. You have parents, you have also the teachers. Because when you talk about mental wellness, especially with disadvantaged, we're not just talking about those who uh, need to process their mis. Uh, process misfortune or trauma it's how do you elevate from from fixed mindset to growth mindset in order to make the learning make make quality learning actually land and convert it into uh, more positive more uh, elevated opportunities for all uh, so this is a space that we we really enjoy being part of it's exciting to be part of such challenging <laughs> big big challenges in the country and uh, you can count us in for for other conversations like this thank you so much for inviting yeah. us yeah thank you miguel how about you elan thanks jv again education is really the most powerful enabler of achieving the sdgs by 2030 and achieving sustainable development for the philippines um, and again i i affirm what isi mentioned with uh, sort of aligning the work that we're all doing within our own sectors and own organizations towards the upcoming Transforming Education Summit next month. Uh, and, you know, just food for thought, because I, I, I know we wish we had, you know, hours to talk about uh, making education more inclusive. But, you know, when, when we're talking about this topic, uh, especially for, the, for our country, the Philippines, we, we absolutely need to also address and work towards providing safer schools, especially for children in our indigenous communities in the Philippines. I mean, the regular struggles of um, LUMAD schools is a prime example of non-inclusive schools um, and non-inclusive education. And we need to do a better job as a country. Uh, and it all starts with the simple acts of you know, building empathy and showing respect. Uh, and lastly, a critical part of Action Track 1 in the UN uh, Transforming Education Summit uh, on inclusive education tackles an issue that our education system really needs to prioritize. Um, and that is our continued learning for students when emergencies arise. So our country is, you know, the most prone to natural calamities, typhoons, you know, smash into our communities every single year um, and they disrupt learning for, for thousands of students for months. So let's, let's build better structures to ensure contingencies are in place to allow teachers to keep teaching and students to keep learning. Um, and I'd like to end just by reminding and remi reminding all of our, our viewers and our panelists today that um, 
as we strive for more inclusive education, none of us are equal until all of us are equal. So thank you, JB and Inquirer. Good afternoon again to all. Thank you, Ilan. How about you, Jacob? Uh, hello, and thank you for having me and ASUS here in this uh, webinar. So thank you again, Inquirer and Project Rebound. Um, ASUS has been the forefront of providing quality solutions to the education industry even before the pandemic started. We remain passionate about our innovating technology to better the lives of people from all walks of life. ASUS for Education empowers educators and students to learn with innovative tools for a brighter future. And together with everyone here, let, let us reach our goal in bridging both learning and teaching experience in this ongoing digital transformation. Looking forward as well to work with other sectors to help and assist ed the education segment here in the Philippines. Thank you. Thank you, JB. And thank thank you, Jacob. Card. And EC. Is, uh, is he still on? Yes. And there. Okay. Thank you. No, I, mean, I just want to thank you for, for this invitation. Um, um, I think, I mean, the Transforming Education Summit that will happen in, in September in New York is a, it's a unique opportunity to put education at the center of the discussion at, at the at the highest political level, so um, it it's an opportunity to mobilize uh, resources for the education system, to mobilize partnerships, and to um, increase the the awareness in, for the general public on on why education is important. So at the country level, it's uh, at the work of all of us to continue um, pushing for education reforms to continue um, uh, working for learning recovery and um, um, ensuring that uh, in the, for example, in the Philippine Development Plan and um, and other planning instruments, education is uh, put at the center. Now we know the DEPED recently launched the basic education development plan. So it, it's uh, one important step in the process is to ensure its implementation the next years until 2030. And thank you so much for, for the invitation again. Thank you, EC. And last but definitely not least, Marco. Thank you, JB. So my closing message would be EBED's motto. And our motto is that education is everyone's business. To the parents of school classes, is going to start. So please enroll your, your students. Let's welcome the new school year with much enthusiasm. For teachers, you have the private sector support in um, teaching our students. And finally, for our policymakers, just you can just easily adopt the recommendations presented earlier by EC and UNICEF for learning recovery. So those are our uh, messages uh, for our viewers. Thank you, JB. Thanks, Marco. Again, we express a gratitude to our speakers for providing us with so many valuable insights. To our viewers, we hope you learned from this webinar. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, everyone, for participating in today's Project Rebound webinar presented by the Philippine Daily Inquirer. We'd also like to thank Inquirer.net, Mega Mobile, and Inquirer Academy. Continue reading the Philippine Daily Inquirer for authoritative views and features. Once again, I'm JB Rufino. The Philippine Daily Inquirer would like to thank the following sponsors for making this live stream event possible. Aboites Data Innovation, data-driven innovation for a better world. ASUS Business, Trust the Experts, Globe, PLDT, Smart. We'd also like to acknowledge the organizations that have partnered with us. Thank you to... We'd also like to thank Inquire.net, Mega Mobile, and Inquire Academy.
in depression sama-sama nating labanan ang gutom sa hapag movement mm-hmm.